Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And then Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Amen. And those verses apply to our passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12 today. And we'll apply them to uh, 1 Peter well, I've got some uh, wonderful opening slides on the screen for you. COVID-19 and the pandemic and modern plagues like cancers and Alzheimer's and AIDS and other diseases. Uh, social and racial tensions in our country, both real and fabricated. The rise of the LGBTQ agenda and all that goes with that. Economic crises, uh, widespread depression in the population, political chaos and turmoil, uh, increasing crime, the rise of Islam, terrorism, tensions in the Middle East and Israel, and Pastor, you have the nerve to title your sermon, Living the Good Life. <laughs> uh, you actually want to talk to us this morning about living the good life? I do, and so does the Apostle Peter. In fact, he wants to talk about living the good life with Christians who are living in a wicked, hostile world like the initial readers of his letter were and like we are today. When I say the good life, it tends to make us think of wealth and abundance and leisure, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous kind of stuff. Uh, Beverly Hills and Palm Springs and expensive villas and exotic cars and where your big decision for the day is directing uh, the crew onto which yacht they're going to take you out in. If you're a little bit more down to earth than that, which I think most of us are, you might, when I say the good life, envision sitting on a nice beach under an umbrella with a nice breeze with your biggest decision of the day where you want to eat a seafood dinner that night. <laughs> or perhaps uh, you're sitting in the mountains in a rocking chair by a roaring fire looking out over a magnificent mountain view while you sip hot chocolate or in my case eat a fried pie. <laughs> Maybe that's what you think of when you think of living the good life. But circumstantially luxurious or leisurely life is not the good life about which the Apostle Peter is speaking in verses 8 through 12. He's talking about the good life that knows peace and has the blessing of God. You know, the people in Beverly Hills and Palm Springs are not on average any happier than the people in Marietta and Powder Springs and Hackworth and Dallas, Georgia. Uh, in fact, some of the most miserable people in the world are people who live for fame and fortune and for the things that money can buy. Amen. Amen. So what is the good life and how do we live it? Well, the Apostle Peter is going to direct us in these verses. Chapter 3, 1 Peter, verses 8 through 12. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, you return blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good, and let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The truly good life comes from having God's blessing upon us, especially in the area of personal relationships. In 
and God's blessings and healthy relationships are connected. They go hand in hand. This is the way the Apostle John says it. He says, if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does, who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? See, being rightly related to God and others is part of the core message of the Bible. If you want to look at Matthew chapter 22, you can see that core message there. Living the good life is connected to having good, healthy relationships. That's why the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 and 18 that I read you says, if so far as it depends on you, you are at peace with others, then life is pretty sweet. Even if you do not have an overabundance of things. But if you are constantly at odds with others, then you can have all the stuff in the world, but life just isn't so good. So the Apostle Paul, Peter, in verses 10 through 12, he's quoting Psalm 34 that I read to you at the beginning of the service, which says that if we want to love life and see good days, does anybody want to do that? love life and see good days. Amen. If anybody wants to do that, then there are some things that we have to do with our lives, and there's some things that we have to do with our lips that will result in, or at least promote, having healthy relationships. And if we do these things, the promise of Scripture is that God's blessing will be on us. Now let me just pause there and say there's God's blessing and there's God's blessings. Every one of us who is a believer, no matter whatever else may or may not happen in this life here, we already have the blessing of God on us in Jesus Christ, in salvation, in having a secure future in heaven that's a good future, it's a preferred future, it's the one that we want. And if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ and you know saving faith, you have the blessing of God, period. No matter what happens in this life or doesn't happen. But having said that, as saved people, as Christians, as believers, there's another level or of having the blessings of God or not having the blessings of God as we live through this life as Christians. You see? Uh, if we live the way the Apostle Peter, meaning the way the Lord, the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Peter, with our lives and our lips the way he's saying, the promise of Scripture, chapter 3, verse 12, is that we will have the blessing, God's blessings on us. And if we do not live this way, if we do not do these things, if we do not live as is being instructed here, then the contrary is true. Then the face of the Lord will be against us. So the good life results from following God's principles for having healthy relationships. From living as God instructs us to live. Meaning that we do good in our walk and we do good in our talk. And from that comes the blessings of God. Now, please keep in mind as we look at these verses, like the verses we've been looking at for, about wives and husbands and uh, slaves and people that are subject to government, the context in which the Apostle Peter is telling us to live like this. And the context is absolutely critical. And it began back in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where the apostle is telling us how to live as aliens and pilgrims in a wicked world that is hostile to us. And he's still doing that. The theme has been all along and continues to be, and will continue into chapter 4, is that we have a witness as Christians in this hostile territory. That's the umbrella. That's the context under which all these comments are made. And Christians are to be different from the world. We are to be distinct in our behavior. And it should be notable that we are obeying God and noticed that we submit to proper authority. We've been looking at that all along, have we not? Whether it be to government, whether it be on the job, whether it be in the home. And the Lord commands us through the Apostle Peter in these summary verses that we're looking at today to live like this. And here's the catch. It is absolutely contrary to the world. It is absolutely contrary to the ways of the world. And what we're told to do, the way we're told to live, is opposed to 
our own natural inclinations. Uh, if we live like this, like the apostle is telling us to live, we will certainly be foreigners in this world and not be at home or feel at home. But we will have a powerful witness for God, and we will please God. And we get to decide which of those we want to do. Do we want to be fit in this world and get along with this world so that we can feel a little good for a little while? Or do we want to have a powerful witness for God in a hostile world and please God? Now, our motive for living this way, and I want to emphasize this, our motive for following these commands and living this way is to please and glorify God. The motive is not so that we can enjoy life. Uh, enjoying life will come, but it is a byproduct of seeking to please God. When we seek to please God, glorify God, by obeying God, by living His way, we get God's blessing. That's the way God has designed life for us here. But when our motive is selfish, when we're trying to use God or manipulate God to get our way so that he is obligated to make us happy, we come up empty. We need to be clear about our motives. And we need to be clear about the context of our Christian witness in this hostile world under which the Apostle Peter tells us to live this way. So you live the good life when you have healthy relationships. And you have healthy relationships when you do good in your walk, in the way you live, in your actions. 1 Peter 3.11 says, Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Which again is a quote from Psalm 34. So when you read that verse, there's something that we must turn away from doing evil. And there's something that we must actively pursue, and that is doing good and seeking peace. So what does doing good in your walk mean? Well, first and foremost, it means turning from evil, turning away from evil. You know, naturally, uh, all of us have a bent toward evil. We're born that way. The word evil is used in these passage five times, and it means living for ourselves, with disregard for God and disregard for others, that we're the ones that matter, that self is what matters, and that we disregard God and others except when it's possible to use them to get what we want and to meet our own needs. Uh, Adam and Eve's original sin plunged the entire human race into sin. We have fallen natures. And when they sinned, it was an act of self-will and disobedience to God's command. You know that even after we inherited that, and then even after we're saved and reborn spiritually, we Christians have to keep on putting to death the old man, do we not? Can there, not every one of us testify to that and give examples of that? I'll give you one easy example. Let's say you're driving to work or to the store, and being the good Christian that you are, and you're listening to one of my preaching CDs on the, <laughs> on the uh, radio, or you're listening to Christian music and you're praising the Lord, and everything is just so good, and then some guy cuts you off, jumps right in front of you, and causes you to jam on the brakes. I'm willing to bet that your first reaction, your immediate reaction, is not to bless that guy and pray for his salvation. That's not mine. Why isn't it? Well, uh, the answer to that question is the same as a toddler who throws a tantrum because he's not getting his way. When we analyze our anger in most situations, it stems from one source, and that source is self or selfishness, that we want our way and we didn't get our way. And that is the old man creeping through whom we have to keep on putting to death even though we've been saved and reborn spiritually. Uh, the well-known line from the Pogo cartoon says it well, we have met the enemy and he is us. And sometimes uh, we can't get out of our own way. Self and selfishness, sin, because that's what it is, is a barrier to the good life. It hinders, it obstructs healthy relationships that bring glory to God. And self and selfishness 
are the source, the root of most of our interpersonal problems. And this verse says that we must turn from evil, which means we must turn from the selfishness which marks all of us as fallen sinners. Uh, we have to make a conscious decision daily to deny ourselves and then act on it and then live it out. So one of the things about doing good in our walk is, is that we have to turn away from evil, from self and from selfishness. And the other piece of it is that we have to pursue peace. It's not enough just to turn away from evil and deny yourself. We also have to actively do good and actively pursue peace with others. The Apostle Paul says it like this, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men, Romans 12 and 18. And then he says in Romans 14 and 19, therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. In other words, peace doesn't just happen. Order doesn't just happen. Uh, if we are indifferent or if we are passive, we have to go after it. You know, uh, I read this story about a mother who was hosting her son's scout troop. And she told her son, I'm not going to take any of you to the zoo if you don't forgive Billy for stealing your candy bar. And her son said, Billy doesn't want to be forgiven. He won't even listen. And she said angrily, well, make him. At which point her son jumped up and chased after Billy and knocked him down to the ground and sat on him and yelled, I forgive you for stealing my candy bar. But it would be a lot easier to forget if you'd wipe the chocolate off your mouth. <laughs> now, we're not supposed to be that aggressive in pursuing peace with others, but you get the idea. Uh, we are not to be indifferent. We are not to not care. We are not to be passive or just let things lie wherever they fall. Jesus said one time that if you're worshiping God and you suddenly remember that your brother has something against you, to get up and leave the worship service, go be reconciled to your brother first, and then come back to the worship service. See, we are to take the initiative and do all we can do to repair and restore strained relationships. If you want to live a good life. If you want to do good in your walk. Um, it certainly is time consuming to do that. It's certainly more messy to seek to put things right than to just let things slide. And most of the time, we'd ne rather not expend the energy or take the time uh, involved to get things straightened out. And so we say things like, well, We'll let some time pass. Time will heal things. And if it's meant to be, it will be. And if it's not meant to be, it won't be. And we use that as an excuse not to take the initiative to pursue peace and reconcile relationships. And besides, it is humbling and sometimes downright humiliating to admit uh, that we're wrong. And so often we don't actively pursue peace with others. Now here's the hard part. If you're the one who's been wronged, just absorb it if you can. So well, that's not fair because you're about to tell me that if I'm the one that's done the wrong, I got to put it right. But that if I get wrong, the other person have, doesn't have to put it right. Yes, they do, but it doesn't mean they always will. So if you can, don't insist on your rights and just absorb the wrong if you can. You don't have to confront Every person, every time you're offended, remember love covers a multitude of sins. But if you have wronged or offended someone, or if their offense is such that you cannot relate to them without clearing it up, then you need to take the time and actively seek peace. Um, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you've wronged somebody. And they, they need to sense the genuineness in you when you do this, you might go to them and say, you know, uh, God has shown me just how wrong I was to name the offense, if you will. I apologize. No excuses. Not what you did to cause it. <laughs> will you forgive me? It could be as simple as that. 
If someone else has wronged you and you want to talk about it, then you need to be careful not to accuse or attack them, but to seek a restoration of the relationship with a spirit of gentleness, remembering that you too are a sinner and that God has given you grace. So to do good in your walk, if you want to have good relationships, if you want to live the good life, then we have to turn from evil, meaning self and selfishness, and actively pursue peace. It also means that your attitude and your actions are going to be characterized by five words that the Apostle Peter gives us. And I'm going to just tell you, this isn't easy. Okay? The first one is being harmonious or unified in thinking or being of one mind. A harmonious person seeks to get along with others, uh, not being self-willed or demanding his own way. And if somebody doesn't want to go along with them or their way, he doesn't judge them because they don't want to do what he wants. The harmonious person is a team player, not a solo player. He considers other people's perspectives and points of view. He gives other people room to be different. He tries to accept people, or she tries to accept people as Christ accepts them. And this is very important for Christians. The person who wants to be of one mind, unified, get along, be harmonious, knows the difference between, now listen, biblical absolutes, which must never be compromised, and gray areas that allow room for some differences. Not every Christian makes that distinction. You know? uh, we need to be able to make, there's some things in Scripture that are normative. They're true for all people at all times, everywhere. There are other things that are open to a little bit more interpretation and allow room for some differences. Uh, the harmonious person gives other people the benefit of the doubt, if at all possible. He gives them time to grow if they're not there yet and realizes that growing is a process that takes some time. In the words of Augustine, on essentials, unity, on non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity or grace. Those are some pretty doggone good words to live by right there. Okay? Now, the only way for Christians who come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different customs, uh, different experiences, different personalities, different ways of thinking, the only way for Christians to really be of one mind, to be unified in thinking, to be harmonious, is to be committed to know what the Word of God says and to obey it. That's the thing that binds us together, that common experience of salvation and of knowing the Holy Spirit. So Christians, and I say this, in a world that is absolutely divided by denominations, by everything you can possibly think of, and that the Christian world is divided by so many things, that we are on the same team with the same interests, with the same worldview, with the same outlook, if we are mutually submitted to God and His Word. And that is absolutely crucial for harmony. We won't have harmony without that. Amen? Amen? So being harmonious, unified in thinking of one mind, is one of the things that ought to characterize your actions if you want to do good in your walk and have healthy relationships and live a good life. Amen? It also says, the Apostle Peter, that we ought to be compassionate or be sympathetic, be affected by feelings. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, that Jesus Christ sympathized with our weaknesses. Thank God. And so we are to enter into what other people are feeling. Romans 12 says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and that we are to weep with those who weep. And we are to allow the sufferings of others to touch our emotions. Uh, you know, we sometimes say, uh, except for the grace of God, there go I. <laughs> you know? Well, we're to be sensitive to how we would feel if we were in another person's place. And we should do all that we can do to make them feel accepted and loved because God made all of us with emotions and healthy relationships must take into account other people's feelings. So that ought to characterize 
our walks, our doing good, so that we can have healthy relationships and live the good life. He says that we should love, brotherly type love. The Greek word there is Philadelphia. Philadelphia means city of brotherly love, meaning brotherly love. As believers, we're all part of the same family, and we forget that so easily. And we are to show brotherly love to one another, but even more than that, being Christians, we're supposed to show brotherly love to people that are outside the family of God because we're all part of the family of the human race. And we're giving a witness for Jesus Christ, and we are to extend brotherly love to uh, them as well. You can read about it in Acts chapter 17 if you would like to do that. And when we have a chance to show brotherly love to other people, non-believers, it often opens or may open a door for us to tell them about Jesus Christ. Isn't that the point of all these verses, that we have a powerful witness for God in a hostile world? Amen. Amen. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. It also says that we should be tender-hearted or kind-hearted or compassionate. And this particular word in the New Testament is only used in this verse and in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And it seems odd, but the root word means our bowels, our guts. It means that being kind-hearted ought to come from the gut, a deep-down kind of feeling that we have toward other people, uh, an in-the-gut feeling where genuine concern for the other person is really there. Now, I don't know how much distinction to make between this word and the word for compassion or, or sympathetic, but I do know that these words contain an element of emotion, emotional meaning that tells us that our Christian behavior following these commands goes way beyond cold duty and obligatory obedience. And that ought to be what we want, what we feel way down in the ground. Not just that we have to do and dread it. Okay? And others should sense that we genuinely care for them from our hearts. And then the Apostle Peter gives us one more way that our walk ought to be characterized in order to live the good life. And that is that we ought to be courteous uh, or humble in spirit. The Bible and Matthew calls it lowliness of mind. And Jesus described himself as being humble in heart. You know that worldly writers, pagan writers during the biblical times, did not see humility as a virtue. They saw it as a weakness. You know, not much has changed. Worldly writers uh, telling us to exert ourselves for our own sake still think that humility is not a virtue. And sadly, many Christian writers don't value humility as a virtue, since most of the books, Christian books dealing with interpersonal relationships, say that first you must learn, love, learn to love yourself and boost your own self-esteem before you can love others. Uh, listen, the Bible, listen to this, the Bible clearly teaches us that we should lower our self-esteem, not raise our estimate of ourselves if we want to have harmonious relationships. Do you know that there's not one verse in the entire Bible that commands us to love ourselves? There are several verses that recognize or affirm that we do love ourselves. And there's the command that we should love others as much as we do in fact love ourselves. But there aren't any verses in the Bible that say low self-esteem is the source of relational problems or that low self-esteem and raising it is the solution to relational problems and that we ought to do that, as popular as that notion is today. But there are many verses that say selfishness and pride, thinking too highly of ourselves, are the sources of our conflicts and that say we must esteem others more highly than ourselves. That's one of those things that got completely backwards in the world today, is completely upside down, but is widely accepted as wisdom, and it's just not true. And yet, some Christian counselors are telling us that our relational problems would all be solved if we would just work on our self-esteem. The Bible says work on your humility, and your relational uh, problems will be solved. So the good life, 
even in that list of things that are happening in our world today, the good life comes from having healthy relationships. And we have healthy relationships by doing good in our walks. And doing good in our walks means turning from evil, selfishness, and seeking peace, pursuing it, and developing these Christ-like qualities in the way we act and the way we behave. Amen? But that's not all. The good news is that we not only have to do good in our walks, we have to do good in our talks. Uh, in some ways, that's even harder. The apostle says that we are to refrain, literally stop, our tongues from evil and our lips from speaking deceit or guile. Chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, our lips, our words, what we say, should back up and support our deeds, what we do, if we want to live the good life. And so the apostle, being ever so helpful as he is to us in these verses, identifies three ways, three aspects that our lips, that our talk ought to be good. Aren't you glad he did that for us? The first one is this, that we are not to retaliate when we are verbally abused. OMG. <laughs> uh, Jimmy and I would just have to about deny our Smyrna roots on that one right there. At least to comply with it. We are not to retaliate when we are insulted or wrong. Instead, we are to give a blessing. Uh, which means that we speak well to the other person and bring good to them. And that is absolutely contrary to the world, is it not? And it's contrary, again, to a lot of advice that's being given in the Christian world. The world says if somebody wrongs you, if somebody insults you, if somebody abuses you, you don't have to take it. Stand up for your rights. You're justified in doing so. Assert yourself and let them know you have more self-respect than that. Uh, the problem is that God says if someone insults you, bless them. Say something kind to them in return. Jesus himself said, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you or spitefully use you. And that absolutely is not easy, but it is what God commands. When I read that, I mean, there's a million examples that come up that convict you, you know, you're, you yourself when you hear those words. But I had this example come up. It was in a race. It was in a short race up at Lake Lanier in a swim portion of it. And the swim is just a mass start, you know, right there. And so all, in certain age groups, male, all the guys go in the water at the same time. It was a short distance to round one buoy. And so all these guys that started out real wide converged on each other at that buoy. And as I got to it, a guy next to me was kept hitting me and swim, trying to swim over the top of me. And I didn't really appreciate it. <laughs> you know? So at first I thought, you know, let it go. So I pushed away from him and kept trying to swim, and here he came again. And this time I appreciated it even less. And so I did the only Christian thing that you could do, and I gave the guy a shot in the ribs. <laughs> it, which when I did, I heard him go out loud, Ooh! and he moved right on. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, that worked pretty well. The trouble is, that in real life, not that kind of situation, when something like that happens, God says, bless him. Well, I wanted to bless him by holding him under, but bless him. <laughs> you know, say something nice. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll let you go. <coughs> Wait and let the guy behind you swim over. Because that's what it feels like when we're in that situation. And we're not talking here about clarifying misunderstandings through reasonable conversation or about seeking truth. There are proper times and ways to give your point of view and speak the truth in a calm and gentle manner. What we're looking at here is when a person is being abusive to you on purpose. He's trying to bait you. He's trying to pick a fight. Uh, they're being abusive to you on purpose. And the apostle says, don't respond to such abuse 
with more abuse. Don't one-up his abuse with a better put-down or with more vicious words. Don't counter his name-calling by calling him even worse names. Don't respond to his sarcasm with more sarcasm. Don't react to his attack by attacking him. Instead, respond with kind words. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you what the Lord commands. That when you are abused, don't retaliate like God. Bless. That's tough, isn't it? That is really tough. And then the second thing he says about our talk is that we are not to be deceitful. That we should stop or refrain our lips from speaking deceit or guile. Uh, the ancient meaning of deceit or guile means to bait, to set a trap, to snare somebody. Um, and really it still means the same thing thing today, we don't use it quite that way. It means anything calculated to deceive or mislead or distort the facts and the truth. Deception bars, hinders, blocks communication and healthy relationship. Deception destroys trust. And it may be a deliberate attempt to bend the truth to suit your needs, to support your position and your side of the story, or perhaps you just leave out something important. That's one of Satan's great tricks. To fail to mention the whole truth so that the other person gets a distorted view, a skewed view of what really is or of what really happened. It may be, may be like telling a person one thing to his face, but saying something to other people behind his back because you want them on your side against the other person. Uh, now let me say that there are times when we need to be tactful, when we need to be wise. So if you're, let me just make this completely exaggerated, if your 500 pound aunt has on short shorts <laughs> and says, do these look good? <laughs> you might not want to tell the literal truth and say, in the name of God, why did you ever put those on? No. You might want to go, it is hot. You know, I mean, you might want to be tactful. But 9 point, it's like the ivory soap factor, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, being truthful and honest is going to be the best policy. And after a while, if you're not, you can't keep up with what you said and what you hadn't said anymore to keep it straight. So we ought not be deceitful. We ought to speak the truth if we want to do good in our talk so that we can have healthy relationships, so that we can really live the good life, which is what? The life that pleases God and has the blessings of God on it. Okay? And then he says one more, and that is that we ought to bless others with words that build them up. Uh, but this has to be genuine. Have you ever talked to somebody that's just over the top flowery and you know they're just doing it, just to be doing it, it doesn't seem real at all? Mm -hmm. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And you really just want to say, if the Apostle Peter would allow you, why don't you just shut up? <laughs> <laughs> but we can't do that. Um, but when we do speak blessing toward others, it needs to be legitimate, it needs to be real. Uh, we are to speak well of others and speak well to others, and we are to speak words that build up and that don't tear down. Uh, listen to this scripture. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear, Ephesians 4.29. And Paul writes in Romans 14, So then let us pursue the things that make for peace and the building up of so, I guess positive talk matters, does it not? Uh, positive thoughts, the things you tell yourself in the midst of hardship or difficulty or struggle, they matter. Uh, and it matters how we help other people do that with our talk. Here's the thing, if we would apply these principles in our homes and on our jobs and with our friends, think how things would change. Think how relationships would change. If we didn't trade insults, if we did not speak deceitfully, 
but instead we were to speak words that build the other person up. If we were not sarcastic or angry or critical or accusatory, how would our relationships change? So I ask you the question based on these verses, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, do we need to repent? I do. And whether you say yes or not, I know most of you pretty well, you do too. The question is, will we? Is it, and if we do, is it just going to be a cathartic moment where we want God to make everything right and we change nothing and go on and do just like we did before? Or do we actually make the adjustments necessary to obey God in these instructions? Some might be thinking, now wait a minute, Pastor. You've been talking about me denying myself and laying down my rights and not retaliating and blessing those who insult or wrong me and being harmonious, sympathetic, loving, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble. But it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. And if you knew my husband or my wife or my kids or my roommates or my boss, you'd know that if I really lived like that, I would absolutely get run over. I'd get trampled because they're not living like that. Who's going to look out for my rights? Which proves we're selfish. Who's going to protect me if I live like that? Well, the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, added verse 12 to answer those questions and to show you God's will. And here's the answer. The Lord's eyes are on the righteous. He hears and attends to the prayers of the righteous. That's the answer. The Lord will do it. But his face is against those who do evil, who live selfishly. So here's the thing, and I put this on the screen for you. This is our responsibility. Our responsibility is to plead God, please God by obeying him and doing his will. By doing good in our walk and doing good in our talk, that's our responsibility. The outcome of it is not our responsibility. What happens or doesn't happen because we do it God's way is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to do good in our walk and talk, to obey Him and please Him. <coughs> and here's the most fantastic part. And then He will be responsible for the outcome. He will be responsible for protecting us, and that doesn't mean that we will never have harm in this life, but it does mean that we will be protected perfectly in eternity. And he is responsible for hearing and answering our prayers. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have him responsible for that than me responsible for that. Uh, I was talking with somebody this week. I don't understand everything that's going on. I don't understand the why about everything that's going on. But I have gotten at least this much wisdom over the years, and that's that I'm pretty sure God knows what he's doing better than I know what I'm doing. And I'm pretty sure that he's more trustworthy than I am. And I'm pretty sure that the wise thing to do is just follow his word and do it and let him take care of all the rest. And then it's off of us. You know what that is? That's casting your cares on him. That is... Go into the Lord in prayer, whom he hears and attends to the prayers of the righteous. His eyes are on us, but his face is against those who do evil. Read Psalm 1. He sees the righteous, but he doesn't see the wicked. Not as individuals whom he's concerned about in terms of judgment. They're just all in this one big group lumped together, but he sees us individually. And I don't know about you, I'd rather, I, I personally would rather have God responsible for my outcomes if I obey him than have it rest on me. Um, one time at a commencement cer at ceremony for West Wellesley College, Barbara Bush was the key speaker, and these are her words. And by the way, in a world like ours, uh, I like Barbara Bush. You know, she was just who she was. And uh, honest and down to earth, even though she was the first lady. It says, as important as, this is what she's telling these graduates, as important as your obligation as a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person will be, you are a human being first. 
And those human connections with spouses, with children, with friends are the most important investments you will ever make. At the end of your life, you will never regret uh, not having passed one more test, winning one more verdict, or closing one more deal. You will regret time not spent with a husband, a child, a friend, or a parent. And then she added this. Our success as a society depends not on what happens in the White House, but on what happens inside your house. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Healthy relationships are at the core of the good life. They are essential if we want to glorify God and enjoy his blessings. So following the commands of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12 that we've been talking about this morning are necessary if we want to live the good life. Uh, and if we would take these things and live them, put them into practice, apply them to our lives and relationships, then our relationships, our families, and our churches would be done. And, remember the context, remember the umbrella, we will give a powerful witness for Jesus Christ in this wicked, hostile world that we live in. Even if the way we behave is different from the world, distinct from the world, contrary to the wisdom of the world, which is exactly what God is commanding us to do. Could I suggest that you might want to memorize these verses? And that you might want to take whatever steps are necessary to live them out and apply them to your life and to your relationships. Because that's how we live the good life. That's how we do it. Um, a lot of the things that we pursue that we think will make us happy don't. hard to understand all that means when you're 15 or 20 or 25. It's a lot easier to understand what it means when you're 55 or 60 or 65. You know? So we, we get to decide whether we're going to learn this, whether we're going to accept this, whether we're going to commit to live by this, whether we're going to make the necessary changes to allow us to live the truly good life. If we went to the writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, and I were to paraphrase and summarize, here's what Paul calls the good life. Being free from yourself and from the bondage of sin, and now free to willingly obey the commands of God. That's the good life. You know, if we live long enough here on earth and Jesus doesn't come back first, uh, there's going to be hardship. I mean, if we pass away from this life here and immediately step into the next life, something will have to be the cause of it. Uh, whether it's a short life or a long life, whether it's a young life that's ended or an older life that's ended. And even if you live a long, good life, this body deteriorates, and at some point, it's just not going to be that good here. You know? And then, we're going to go from enjoying the blessings of God for a little while in this life, because we sought to obey Him and please Him here, and we're going to cross over into the, abs I guess instead of the good life, I call it the magnificent life. I mean, the beyond your imagining ability life heavenly life. Amen? Amen? But until that time comes, I would like to do it God's way and enjoy all the blessings that are beyond salvation that we can have here that I can get. Would you not? You know, when it's all said and done and people talk about us, what do you like them to say? Here. He was a godly man. She was a godly woman. And not say, he was a worldly man. <laughs> he was a worldly woman. This world is upside down, backwards, wrong, and they fit into it so well. 
let's agree today being part of a Christian family on the same team to do things God's way and be of one mind. Amen. Amen. God bless you and go in peace today. And please remember those in